This is my less than 100 square foot electronics focus workshop. Today I'll cover how I built the workshop and what I use the workshop for. This will include everything from where I work at the computer to how I organize such a small space, the area that I build, test, and solder circuits in, how I record videos, and the methods I use to keep the workshop well ventilated. With that being said, I hope you enjoy this quick tour of the workshop. One of the most common things I do in the workshop is actually design and build circuits. For boards with large components or not that many components, I'll do this by hand with a soldering iron. But for more complex and intricate boards, I use a pick and place machine which in a nutshell takes components off of tapes or reels, picks them up using suction, takes a picture of the component to adjust its orientation, and then places them on a circuit board. Surrounding the machine, I have various components that I'm not currently using. Some are from previous or future projects for the pick and place machine, and others are parts that I commonly need to hand solder. There are two ways to feed components to the pick and place machine. For most components, it picks from reels. The majority of these reels have things like capacitors, resistors, or inductors because of how cheap they are. These are mounted on either side of the machine and slowly get fed in as they get used. Then for things like ICs, which are typically more expensive, it makes sense to only buy 10 or 20 components. These get cut from larger reels and arrive as a short tape. These parts I have mounted inside the machine on 3D printed trays that attach using magnets. Here's a good example of the machine picking up from one of those small 10 or 20 component tapes. As the machine has been placing components, it hasn't been just putting them directly on the pads themselves. There's actually an interface layer that I applied before that's basically a metallic paste the components will stick to. And once the pick and place machine is finished, I can take the board out of the machine and put it in what's called a reflow oven, where the board is gradually heated to the point that the paste will turn into a solid metal that mechanically and electrically connects the components to the PCB. The next section of the workshop is where I test and debug finished boards. The main equipment I use to do this is a two-channel oscilloscope, a DC power supply, and a programmable electronic load. What the oscilloscope does is graph voltage over time, giving a view into what is actually happening inside of the PCB. This makes it possible to see what components or traces might be causing issues. And this obviously requires some way of actually connecting to the circuit board itself which for most connections, a simple oscilloscope probe works fine, but for harder to reach connections like actual solder pads, I use this PC Byte probe, which gives you really fine control when placing probes on small pads. Then the power supply obviously lets me power the board and the electronic load allows me to test the capability of the board to deliver power. Across the workshop, I have an old TV that depending on the board I'm testing, I'll have, say, data sheets up on the screen or schematics to actually test and verify if parts are wired correctly or if I just made a mistake somewhere. Typically when I'm at the computer, I'm either 3D modeling, programming, doing circuit design, reading data sheets, or doing research. For a lot of these tasks, having two monitors is a real productivity improvement especially for things like circuit design where you want to have your main program like KiCad up on one monitor and data sheets up on another. Some of the other things that are more specific to me is I like a split keyboard, mostly for the ergonomics. Also for CAD work, I have a space mouse. This is a great tool for rotating models quickly. And then for any prototyping I might want to do at the desk, I have two power supplies and a portable battery powered breadboard that I made. Typically I'll use these when I'm debugging and programming a new PCB. What's nice is that I can work with the breadboard at the computer where I can reprogram things or I can move it to the prototyping area where I have the oscilloscope for any debugging. For storage in the workshop I have a few different systems that I use. 
For small components with lots of variants like screws or connectors, I use these generic divider bins that each have 30 or so sections. For the majority of things that I store, I use Acro Mills bins. These also work well for small parts, but also medium sized parts. There are 3D models that people have made that you can download and print to further divide the bins for parts with a few variants. For larger parts, I use these Acro Mills containers that I mounted to the wall. These work well for things like cables or fans or really anything that doesn't fit in the previous two storage options I have. And then for storing things like tools, wire, or tape, I have metal pegboards that I mounted to the wall. Now looking more at the electronics portion of the workshop, I'll start with the soldering station. Here I have a microscope, a desoldering gun, a hot air station, and a soldering iron. The reason why I use this microscope specifically is because it goes from a 7x zoom up to a 45x zoom making it really good for large parts and also really small parts. It also has a third port that I mounted a camera to that allows me to record what I'm soldering onto a micro SD card. The camera also has an HDMI out that I connected a small external monitor to so I can position the board I'm soldering before I look through the microscope. The soldering iron that I'm using is a Hakko T12 clone that I hooked up to a DeWalt battery so I can solder things anywhere in the workshop if I need it. The desoldering gun I'm using is a generic Chinese model that does seem to work pretty well and has been really useful for desoldering through whole components. And then I have a quick branded hot air station that I primarily use for soldering surface mount components, but also installing heat shrink or really anything that a hot air station is good for. For 3D printing in the workshop, I use both resin printers and also FDM printers. For resin printing, I have a Mars Pro and Hallet Mage. I mainly use the Hallet Mage because it's a much larger printer. For detailed parts, these printers are great, specifically for things that I couldn't print on an FDM printer. The one big pain with resin printing is the cleanup process and curing process required for each part. To fully cure a part, I have to first wash it in isopropyl alcohol, then rinse with soap and water, cure with UV for 30 minutes, and after that, bake in an oven at around 150 Fahrenheit for at least six hours. So with that being said, I basically only do resin prints when it's absolutely necessary. For FDM printing, I have a Voron 2.4. This is a do-it-yourself kit 3D printer that you buy as parts and put together yourself. There's dedicated instructions that are very easy to follow and teach you how a 3D printer works as you put it together. The printer itself really isn't any better than say a Bamboo Labs or Prusa printer. It's a good printer to buy if you really want to learn and understand how 3D printers work on a fundamental level so you can fix your printer in the future if things break or if you want to upgrade it. I would really only recommend this printer to people who see 3D printing as more of a hobby and not as much as a tool because there will be issues that you'll have to debug and fix. One difficulty of trying to record in a workshop this size is where to place the camera and tripod. At first I tried just to place it on the ground, but I quickly realized that both recording and also working in such a small space was really difficult. So I decided to design and print a custom rail system that mounts to the ceiling with both a mount for the tripod and also a studio light. This allows me to reposition them basically anywhere in the workshop, and because they're mounted to the ceiling, they're mostly out of the way. This also allows me to get shots that I previously wasn't able to do, like top-down shots where I have both the light and camera positioned directly above what I'm trying to film, or really close-up shots where I can angle the camera down into a tight space, like when I'm trying to film soldering at the microscope. One of the most important features for a workshop like this is having good ventilation. For me, this is especially true because of how small the workshop is and the fact that I'm soldering and also 3D printing. 
At the soldering station, I have a flexible hose that branches off of the main ventilation line. This section can be closed off from the rest of the loop to give more suction to the other areas. The second section first feeds down to the resin printer box, then passes through to the filament printer on the left. For cooling, I'm using a standard window mount AC that sits outside the workshop. I modified it to feed everything back into the workshop through two cutouts for the air and one for the controls. The last system is for monitoring and regulating the environment of the workshop. This means looking at the VOCs and also CO2. If it detects levels that are too high, it'll turn on two window mount fans with HEPA filters that blow air into the workshop to try and improve the air quality. Now that I've gone over how the workshop is today, let's look back at how it started. To make sure the layout in my head would actually work in reality, I decided to make a 3D model of the workshop. Here's the prefabricated hollow shell of the workshop that first off needs to get painted. With this done, I could now start working on the inside. The first thing to add was both networking and power. After this was finished, I could start adding insulation. Next was the framing for what would become the desk that stretches the entire back wall of the workshop. For flooring, I used these rubber tiles that you would typically use if you were building a gym. Next was adding the interior walls. With the walls finished, I could start adding storage and moving my tools into the workshop. I hope you enjoyed this tour of the workshop. If you did, make sure to subscribe and like the video. And if you want any additional information on the workshop, check out my website. It'll be linked in the description. And if you want to know more about the tools I use here in the workshop, those will also be linked, so look out for that. And I hope you enjoyed this video, and that's it.